Greetings, everybody. Tony, you want to get us started on, on anything? You're on mute. Uh, the famous line from Zoom. Yes. Um, you know, we're good. You can start, Jeff. Yeah. All right, good. Hi, everybody. Uh, good, good to see you. Uh, <coughs> I want to talk about work today uh, and uh, also leisure, because uh, that's uh, another part of uh, daily life. So we don't want to just promote jobs. We want to promote leisure time uh, and uh, quality time outside of work. And uh, I will uh, look at this uh, question of work from a historical point of view, a technological point of view, and a philosophical point of view. And uh, let me share, uh, share my screen uh, and we'll get started if I can find, there we go. So today I want to consider uh, the changing world of work. Uh, it is said in the Bible that we will uh, earn our daily fare by our toil. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, human beings have been toiling uh, for survival uh, uh, as a part of our basic nature. But the nature of that toil has certainly changed over time. And uh, actually, I will suggest that we have some chance of escaping from the hard toil to a very significant extent. And indeed, much of the world uh, already has. And those who remain in toil today have a good chance to escape from that harsh toil in the coming years. That, I think, should be our, uh, one, one of our principal objectives uh, when it comes to the question of work. What kind of work do people do? Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, how does work translate into uh, living conditions uh, and to uh, place in society? It's a complicated issue and a very fundamental issue. In American society, work determines a tremendous uh, amount of uh, one's place uh, in uh, the social order and in the economic order. Uh, people who are without work or in a very uh, precarious work uh, are also in a very precarious state in society. Doesn't have to be that way. That is a matter of economic and social organization and policy, and it's part of what I want to discuss today. Well, if we look back to the origins of civilization, which can be dated uh, roughly uh, 10 to 12,000 years ago with the onset of the agricultural revolution and uh, sedentarism, uh, work was overwhelmingly <laughs> from that point and preceding it as hunter-gatherers, work was primarily to secure the basic food for survival. And since the ability to collect and gather food or to uh, uh, grow food crops uh, was uh, based on uh, what today are look like very basic technologies, most of the time of uh, human uh, effort was devoted to securing food. And most of uh, the work in uh, human society from the start was therefore in agriculture. With the advances of technology and especially with the improvements in the capacity to grow food through uh, science and through mechanization and through an understanding of, uh, uh, of uh, many dimensions of agronomy, uh, such as uh, the nutrients for crops, uh, such as pest management uh, and so forth, uh, 
output per farmer rose over time. And that meant that not everybody in society had to be engaged in food production in order to produce the food for daily survival. And it is the long-term uh, rise of productivity in agriculture that is the single most important shaper of employment in uh, society. And that remains true today, looking across the world. So I like to think of it in very, very basic terms. I like to think of it this way, that uh, the importance of uh, agricultural productivity for work is uh, simple to understand in these terms. If one farm household can just feed itself, uh, and that's true on average across the society, it will basically be the case that society has to be engaged in farming. Uh, otherwise, uh, there wouldn't be survival. Uh, this situation applies in very poor settings in rural Africa today, where farm families farm perhaps a half a hectare or one hectare of land. Uh, a hectare is uh, roughly two and a half acres of land. And that is enough to produce one ton or two tons of maize, for example. And that's enough to subsist on. Uh, so the crop is not even brought to the market. It's uh, used for own consumption and the family survives on subsistence. And if that is the norm in a region of villages, then almost everybody in that region would be engaged in farming. Maybe off season, uh, they would be engaged in other activities, rebuilding the house uh, or handiwork or other kinds of labor. But the proportion of the population engaged in work as farmers would be nearly 100%. If on average one farm family can feed two families because the productivity is twice as high per family, per farmer, uh, then only half of the households in the society would need to be farmers and the other half would be engaged in other activities could be craftsmanship, uh, could be uh, uh, activities uh, such as uh, mining and manufacturing, it could be construction, it could be trade, commerce, the provision of services, it could be uh, work uh, in uh, the government administration as a administrator or a clerk or a part of the army. But once there is enough productivity for each farm family that it produces a surplus, then the proportion of households that are engaged in farming will be inverse to the productivity surplus. If one farm family can feed 10 families, then roughly speaking, only 10% of households in the economy will be farmers. And if one farm family can feed 100 families, then only one out of 100 households would have to be engaged as farmers. Well, throughout uh, history, we've really gone from that first condition where essentially everybody was engaged in agriculture to the fourth uh, position there where one farm family in the United States feeds 100 families on average, and the share of farmers in the U.S. workforce has declined to 1%. Astounding. It's not that food isn't important. It's that 1% of the workers in our society are able to produce the food for 100% of the population. That is because of the dramatic increases of output per farmer. That output increase has depended on two factors, raising output for each hectare or each acre of land, that's a land productivity measure, and it's depended on larger farms, more hectares per farm family. 
And that typically depends on mechanization because with mechanization, it's possible to farm much larger farm areas by one individual. And today, American farms are, can be thousands of acres. Uh, and so uh, huge farms farmed by a very small number of people because the machines do all the farming. And today it's even more the case because the machines literally do the key part of the farming. Uh, they don't even need a farmer anymore because the machines are now self-driving. They are guided by GPS. They engage in precision agriculture, dropping just the right fertilizer amounts of different kinds of fertilizer in the right plots of this large farm area, depending on the needs of the soil in that particular place. <coughs> and one farmer told me that even though he doesn't actually have to be on the self-driving uh, tractor anymore, he likes to go for a ride, but he actually doesn't do any of the farming because the machines do, do it all. So we should expect over time that the nature of work in society shifts from agriculture to non-agricultural activities, from nearly 100% engaged in agriculture in a very low income, basic setting of uh, low productivity to virtually no uh, workers engaged in agriculture in a highly productive machine-based large farm agriculture as in the United States. If you look at virtually any society in the world, therefore, and look at the changing nature of work in that society, you will find pictures like this. These are uh, estimates actually, interestingly, over a period of 700 years <coughs> of the share of workers engaged in agriculture. So it goes back to the Middle Ages uh, of Europe, the high Middle Ages, uh, just before the Renaissance, uh, just at the time of uh, the, the Black Death. And according to these estimates, uh, in uh, France and Poland, 70 to 80 percent of the population was engaged in farming at the time. Uh, in England, uh, the Netherlands and Italy, where life was somewhat more commercial, agriculture somewhat more productive, uh, and uh, the economy dependent more on international trade of non-foods, uh, uh, slightly lower proportion. But you can see that over the course of centuries, and sorry for the way the graph is uh, written, these are not equal spacings. Uh, it goes, uh, as you can see, uh, from 1750 to 1800 to 1980, and I should have spaced that better uh, than I did when I uh, printed out this picture. Uh, there was, especially after 1800, a decisive uh, decline of the share of the workforce in agriculture because there was a decisive increase in the output per farmer that came from mechanization and from the consolidation of small farms into large farm holdings. So it is typical today in the high income countries of Europe that the share of the population engaged in farming is well below 10%, typically below 5%, and in a few countries like the United States below 2%. This is a, a cross-sectional picture, I think for 2017, if I remember correctly, it's a scatter diagram where on the horizontal axis is the gross domestic product per person. So it varies from a few hundred dollars per person uh, up to $30,000 per person uh, in this uh, subset of countries. And on the vertical axis is the share of the employment in the agricultural sector. You can see that this is basically a downward sloping uh, scatter plot where countries at low levels of GDP and low levels of productivity still have 
80% or higher of the workforce in agriculture and countries at high levels of income to the uh, lower right-hand side of this diagram have well below 10% of employment in agriculture. All of this is to stress that when we think about the future, for example, of Africa, uh, where 50% or more of workers are currently in agriculture, we should expect in 30 or 40 years on general principles that that number will decline to 10 or 15% rather than staying high at 50%. It's sometimes said that we should make agriculture more productive so that uh, young people find a career in agriculture. But the truth is if we make agriculture more productive, it means that a smaller proportion of households will feed the entire population uh, and the rest of the households will find it unremunerative to stay in agriculture and they will move to other occupations. Agriculture is inherently rural because the key to agriculture is a large land area relative to population. That's the farm or the pasture land or the commons, whereas the other major professions, the other major categories of work, say construction or industry or retail services or education or healthcare or other types of work tend to be more productive in face-to-face -face encounters in urban areas. So as farm families find it uh, economically motivated to leave farming to look for other kinds of employment opportunities, typically that involves not only a change of sector, but a change of residency from rural areas to urban areas. So just as development is associated with the declining share of work, of work in agriculture, so is development associated with a rising share of the population living in urban areas. The United States is a dramatic case of uh, this uh, shift. If we look back to the end of the Civil War period, about 50% of the US population at that point was engaged in farming, fishing, and forestry. What were the rest of the population? Uh, what was the rest of the population doing? Uh, a small number would have been engaged in mining, of course. Uh, many workers would have been engaged in construction. Some would have been engaged in uh, manufacturing production activities. Some would have been engaged in small shops and in retail sectors, some in local craftsmanship and services and a small proportion in public administration or in public sector work like teaching or in the army. So about half of the population was engaged in agriculture, but because of the rise of output per farm family, that has declined to this extraordinary low level. So farming is just not a major part of the employment uh, in the United States anymore, though it was the dominant sector of the United States in the middle of uh, the 19th century. Now, where did that rise of output per worker come from? In the US case, from two underlying increases, one in more output per land or crop productivity, how many tons of maize or how many bushels of maize do you get per acre of land? That <coughs> increased roughly by uh, four times between 1948 and 2017. That's the orange line. And how much land is there per farm worker? That increased roughly three times between 1948 and 2017. That's because a farm could have fewer workers on it as it was mechanized and because farms themselves became consolidated. Uh, so small farms were merged into larger farms. Well, if 
output per worker uh, is equal to output per land times land per labor and output per land increase four times and output per labor incre uh, land per labor increase three times, then you can see that the output per farm worker increased by 12 times between 1948 and 2017. That's why work shifted from agriculture in the United States to other sectors of the economy. Now, what other sectors uh, took up the uh, decline of agricultural work? We can roughly define the US labor force according to a classification of primary, secondary, and tertiary, I spelled it wrong here, I'll correct that, uh, tertiary sectors. The primary employment sector is agriculture and mining, though in this picture, it's only agriculture. I couldn't separate the mining out. The second sector of the economy is called industry, and it includes construction, manufacturing, and the public utilities like electricity and water and, and sanitation. <clears throat> the tertiary sector is the service economy. The service economy includes jobs in wholesale trade, in retail trade, uh, in finance, in transport like trucking and warehousing uh, like Amazon uh, does, in services like healthcare, <coughs> social support, education, in entertainment, uh, travel and accommodation, <coughs> in uh, personal services, uh, when you go to a shop uh, for a shoe repair, uh, uh, and in public administration. So what you can see here is a famous pattern that is very much consistent with the development in general. As the United States economy developed from 1860 till today, the economy started out with most workers in the primary sector, agriculture, and a small part in mining, not shown here, uh, with uh, a uh, manufacturing and uh, industrial sector, I should say, that is relatively small, about a quarter of the workforce, and with a service or tertiary sector uh, that was uh, something uh, around 30% uh, of the workforce. Then over the course of economic development, first the manufacturing sector increased uh, in size uh, as share of the population, roughly from 25% of the workforce to around 40 percent of the workforce uh, in the middle of the 20th century. And then that industrial workforce started to decline, actually. Uh, so output, uh, I'm sorry, employment in industry shown in the orange uh, line here uh, fell from around 30% in 1950 to uh, something around 12 or 13% today. So in the U.S. economy, 1% is in agriculture, 1% or so is in mining, uh, and something on the order of uh, another uh, perhaps 13% is in manufacturing plus construction. And that means that the total of the primary and secondary sectors of the economy is only uh, around 15% uh, of total employment. It's shocking. Of course, we think about farmers, we think about coal miners, we think about people on the assembly line, we think about construction workers, but that whole group, which combines the primary and the secondary sectors of the economy, which uh, are called uh, today is a group, the goods producing part of the economy is only around 15% of employment. And then the uh, gray line here, the tertiary or service economy 
is 85% of employment in the US economy. So this uh, three-part shift from a basically primary economy to a basically tertiary economy is the uh, standard transformation that we see in virtually all countries in the process of economic growth. Why did the primary sector decline this way? Not because we stopped eating, but because the production of food uh, was uh, so uh, 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 became so highly productive per worker, so that just a, a small proportion of the population can provide the food for all, and the demand for food does not increase in proportion to the economy, it increases roughly in proportion to the population. Uh, and so as a small proportion of the population could feed the others, you get this basic decline. Why did the industrial share of the workforce decline from 1950 onward? Is that because manufacturing and industrial output fell in the United States? For example, as jobs uh, were uh, shifted to China or to Mexico, actually, that's not the main reason. The main reason that employment in industry declined as a share of the workforce is similar to the reason why it declined in the primary sector. And that is that the output per worker in manufacturing and industry increased so much that even though output of manufacturing has continued to be rising, the employment has declined over time because the jobs can be done more and more by the machines. Literally on the assembly line, the assembly line worker has been replaced by the robot in the automotive sector and in other sectors. And similarly and more generally, uh, because of smarter uh, machines and machine-based systems, fewer workers are able to produce the manufacturing output. The service economy has therefore been the uh, place where uh, output has continued to, uh, employment has continued to rise, partly because uh, productivity has not soared in those sectors. Uh, the Though I'm giving a lecture a little bit differently from how I would have done it 10 years ago because we're on Zoom, it's still basically the same lecture, although now I have a PowerPoint and now I get to do it by Zoom. But the productivity of uh, my work probably hasn't gone up uh, anything like the farmer's productivity uh, because of uh, perhaps the nature of uh, this kind of activity. And we then end up with this pattern where so much of the work of the primary and secondary sectors are effectively done by the machine uh, that uh, the remaining employment is overwhelmingly in the tertiary sector of the economy. This is also tied to a shift of the kinds of jobs that are done. Uh, the sectors can be categorized uh, in the following way. We've looked at this before uh, when we talked about income distribution. We can talk about uh, the trained workforce with higher education, especially the management and professional part of the workforce. These are managers, financial specialists, healthcare workers, teachers, STEM workers in science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. And that's the blue line. As the machines have uh, gotten smarter uh, in uh, agriculture and manufacturing, uh, the workforce that works alongside those machines has needed to become more and more skilled. Uh, and that's also true in the uh, financial health uh, and education sectors. So alongside this rising productivity of uh, machinery, uh, we've had a rising skill base of the workforce. The production sector in this case 
categorizing all of the sectors engaged in uh, goods producing activities and manual labor. So it includes agriculture, mining, construction, manufacturing, production, transport, and manual labor. That share of occupations declined from uh, around 90% in 1860 uh, to uh, a quarter of the population today. We became overwhelming or dominantly a management and professional based labor force with a this much, much smaller share of the workforce engaged in production activities of any kind, yeah. including manual work, including transport, uh, as well as the goods producing sectors and the share of occupations in two other sectors, personal services and in sales, uh, each uh, remain about 10% of uh, the total occupational structure. The main point that I wanna emphasize here is that not only is the workforce become more uh, service-based, it's become far more skill-based than in the past. And the decline of production work and the rise of management and professional work has been associated with a widening gap of earnings as well, because the earnings of managers and professionals have increased over time as the demand for their labor has risen. Whereas the earnings of workers in the productive sectors in agriculture, mining, construction, manufacturing, transport and manual services has declined over time as those jobs have been replaced more and more by the machine. So you can think about this trend as a shift of sectors of the economy. You can think about this trend as being sociological that the US went from a working class on the assembly line or at the construction sites or in farming to a professional class in Manhattan, uh, in uh, the office uh, buildings of Manhattan. That's a sociological change. It's also a political change because uh, these are different class interests and they tend to be different voting interests as well. And we can think about it as a major factor of the changing income inequality as well, because a gap has opened up uh, strongly of education and earnings. And I've shown you this uh, picture before, uh, but it shows the rising difference of earnings of those with a bachelor's degree versus those with a high school diploma or high school dropout. We've had a widening inequality according to educational attainment. And that has sorted uh, because of the changing demand for different kinds of work. And especially, broadly speaking, the advance of technology, which has uh, displaced uh, production workers and favored uh, and required the complementary work of managers and professionals. And I showed you this also, that this means that the lifetime earnings gap between those with higher degrees and those with lower degrees is vast and has widened over time. So these changes of the labor market, which are driven overwhelmingly by technological changes, then impinge heavily on the inequalities that we discussed last week. And I also indicated that part of the shift of output, uh, or I'm sorry, of production uh, to uh, automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, uh, and uh, machine systems in general, seems to be associated with a long-term decline of the share of overall national income that's accruing to workers. So 
This is the labor share of output, labor share meaning the compensation of employees relative to the total output uh, in the non-farm business sector of the economy. And you see that this curve is going down. More and more income is being earned not by workers, but by corporate profits or by the owners of property, including importantly, intellectual property. So patent holders who are earning a increased uh, income flow from their intellectual property are taking a larger and larger share of output. All of this to uh, summarize is it puts, uh, I wanna put this in the following way in terms of the changing world of work. Work uh, to produce the goods and services of the economy takes place in the three main sectors, the primary, the secondary, and the tertiary sector. How labor demand is allocated across those sectors is shaped by technology and the uh, relative demands for different kinds of goods and services. The main factor changing the allocation over time between the primary, secondary, and tertiary sector jobs has been technological change, and especially the uh, technologies from the Industrial Revolution onward. They allowed increasingly for the mechanization of agriculture and mining and the replacement of workers in manufacturing by machines in the manufacturing process. And as that has taken place, that has led to the shift of work out of the primary and secondary sectors into the service economy. And it's led to a declining labor demand for basic skilled workers who are replaced by the machines and to a rising demand for skilled workers who manage the machines and who manage uh, uh, parts of the service sector, such as the teachers and the doctors, uh, the uh, financial specialists, uh, the lawyers and so forth with uh, higher education and, and professional degrees. Now, on the whole, these technological advances raise output and they disrupt the labor market and they affect income distribution. The total output in the society per worker rises as this uh, technological advance proceeds. The distribution of the output, of course, changes markedly with some parts of society losing in absolute terms, even as the economy is expanding. And the uh, first round of <laughs> those who lose income from this technological change are the workers who are most easily replaced by the machines. And that's what's happened in our society, that that widening income inequality uh, has resulted in uh, a widening gap according to educational attainment. But there's another aspect of uh, what rising productivity means, not only a change in uh, the kind of work we do, but a change that is also dramatic in how we spend our lives. One part of that change, obviously, is uh, if we were, uh, if we were uh, engaged together 200 years ago, we would be talking to each other across the fence of our farms because we'd all be farmers uh, and we'd be spending long days in the field. Uh, today, we are speaking in an educational context because more and more life for more and more young people is spent in delaying the entry into the workforce uh, and adding more training, more years of schooling, uh, not only going from primary to secondary education to a bachelor's degree, 
uh, and for many of you and for many in society and in increasing proportions to some kind of professional or advanced degree as well. So that's a change of uh, our uh, uh, allocation of time in our lifetimes. Another change takes place at the other end of life. People are living longer, thanks also to these technological advances, and therefore spending more years in retirement out of the workforce, having saved for retirement years so that their accumulated wealth can now be used to finance consumption during retirement. But retirement was hardly a concept for most people through most of human history. You worked till you died uh, because you had to uh, and because life was much shorter. Now, uh, with the life expectancy 80 or higher in the high income world, people retire and have more leisure time at uh, retirement age uh, and so on. Uh, and that's another major change in the allocation of our uh, lifetime. But there's another change also that I want to emphasize, and that is the number of hours that we work uh, in a year at our remunerated employment. That has tended to go down sharply over time. Work hours per individual worker exceeded uh, 3,000 hours per worker in the middle of the 19th century. And now in the United States, average about 1,700 hours per worker. Uh, so there's been more than 1,000 hours per year. Uh, if you think about it as 40 hour work weeks, that's 25 weeks decline of uh, of work, or if you think about it in terms of the uh, 8,740, uh, I think it is, or 60 uh, hours uh, in a year, uh, we have had a reduction of 12 to 1,300 hours per year, uh, a significant share of maybe a, a sixth or a seventh of our lives or several hours per day shifting from work to non-work activities. A bit of that uh, in increased schooling on average, a lot of it in increased leisure time or time at home uh, and uh, time off of the long daily toil and drudgery of agricultural work. This uh, graph with limited information for many developing countries shows an estimate of average working hours for a full-time worker in different parts of the world. Uh, the United States is in green because our average work hours are about 1,750. Uh, Mexico, you see, uh, is in uh, kind of turquoise. That's because uh, work hours are more than uh, 2,100 hours. Mexi Mexican people, Mexican workers on average work a lot longer hours uh, than Americans. Uh, in Asia, the uh, number of work hours, it tends to be much larger. And in North uh, Europe, you can see a few countries in yellow here. Uh, that means that their average work hours are under 1,500 hours per year. What does that mean in uh, Norway, uh, in Germany, in Denmark? It means they have long summer vacation times, uh, which is very nice, often six to eight weeks uh, of uh, summertime for average workers in the society. So with higher productivity and higher incomes, there is the opportunity not only for more schooling, not only for more retirement, but for more leisure time during the core working years as well. I'm a big proponent of that. I think that uh, the opportunity for people to have time off from work, certainly family leave, sick leave for sure with pay, 
and vacation days is extremely beneficial for the quality of life. And in rich societies, we should be availing ourselves of the benefits of high technology, not just by asking where are we going to work, but asking how can we share the leisure time more adequately across different countries of the world. So this brings me to the final topic uh, for today uh, of thinking about the future of work. And the important point is we can extrapolate from what we've just seen because those underlying trends of uh, shifting sectoral work, uh, of uh, shifting urban-based work, uh, of uh, shifting skill-based work, of rising schooling, of rising retirement, of rising leisure time are robust changes that are a response to ongoing technological advances that continue. And so extrapolating from these past trends to the future is on the whole merited. We should expect not a revival of mass numbers of manufacturing jobs, because the machines that do the manufacturing are just too good for that. We should not expect a, a surge of the number of farmers. We should not expect a surge of uh, employment in mining because the uh, mining uh, machinery is gonna actually do all of the mining on its own without the need for uh, human miners uh, in the future. So the trends that have brought us to this rather amazing uh, structure, shift of structure of work have every reason to continue into the future and therefore give us uh, an opportunity not only to project forward future trends, but to think about the policy implications of those trends. Uh, so the first trend I would say for the United States is uh, that we should look to the example of other countries to know that uh, we're working too long uh, on average in the US. This is uh, mostly because we don't have a social welfare state that is as developed and beneficial as that in Europe. Uh, but here you can see that uh, in the US, uh, typical workers are working, uh, as I said, more than 1,750 hours per year. Whereas in Denmark and Norway, it's under 1,400 hours. It's a difference uh, basically of 400 uh, hours per year of uh, less work in Scandinavia and uh, other countries of Northern Europe. But what is 400 uh, hours? At, if you think about a 40 hour work week, that's 10 weeks of difference. Uh, what it signifies again is not so much uh, the fact of shorter hours per day or per week, but longer vacation time, uh, which is uh, much beloved in Northern Europe and much missed by many, many workers in the United States. I believe that one of the implications of this is that we should ensure more paid vacation time of American workers and take the example of uh, the Northern European countries to uh, find the specific regulatory mechanisms to bring that about. This graph, uh, which you can look at closely, uh, is a fascinating snapshot of how Americans use their time today. And again, give, giving us some vision into uh, how time will continue to adjust in the future. So the Census Bureau uh, does an annual survey of how Americans use their 24 hours per day. And what I want to emphasize here is actually already how little we work on average uh, if we consider the entire adult population. So if you look at the left-hand column of numbers, uh, which is a little hard for you to read, but you'll study it closely, 
It starts out at the top with all activities being 24 hours. That's our day. Uh, personal activities, mostly sleep, uh, is 9.6 hours a day. Uh, we spend uh, uh, 1.18 hours eating and drinking, according to uh, the survey results. And household activities, uh, homework, uh, preparing food, uh, managing the household is almost another two hours per day. We spend about uh, three quarters of an hour, 45 minutes a day on average buying things. So consumer purchases and uh, so on. Uh, that's about 45 minutes a day on average. We spend about uh, 0.49 or half an hour per day, 30 minutes per day on average caring for other household members. And work for a typical American adult is 3.6 hours per day. That's, I'm sorry, work uh, and work-related activities, including commuting, is 3.61 hours a day. Working by itself is 3.26 hours a day. So about three hours, 20 minutes a day is the average time that an American adult works. Three hours, 20 minutes. It seems small. Of course, if you are at work, the typical workday will be almost eight hours. But so many Americans are not at work on a given day, uh, nearly half, because they're in school, they're in retirement, they're on leave, they're unemployed, or uh, some other activity outside of work. But it's impressive that the U.S. economy can run this uh, uh, $21 trillion annual output with adults in America working on average uh, just uh, three hours, 20 minutes a day. And that number has continued to decline over time. Now, what do, we, what do Americans do with the rest of their day? It's not overwhelmingly impressive in one sense. Uh, leisure time and sports time, which I like, is five hours uh, and uh, 5.19 hours. That's good. But uh, the biggest category of that is watching television. Uh, Americans average 2.81 hours per day watching television. This is Americans 16 and over. So Americans watch television almost as much as they work on a typical day. Uh, it would be nice if socializing, communicating, educational activities, uh, organizational and civic activities was a larger number. So I personally would like to see the shift away from the television uh, and more towards uh, other activities. But the point I wanna make uh, out of this is that we're already in a quite advanced stage where the machines do so much of the work that our ability to manage a sophisticated, rich economy on a limited number of hours per day is already present. And uh, of course, how we engage in that work has also changed tremendously. COVID accelerated the change. This is a graph showing the proportion of workers at different age uh, levels uh, that are working online from home uh, because of COVID. And that number was 35% uh, of the workforce last May. It's come down a little bit, but it's still roughly a quarter of the workforce in the United States now works from home. And I suspect that that number will uh, first stabilize and then grow uh, over time because the ability to work from home, uh, at least in blended working where uh, one works from home for a few days a week and perhaps goes to an office uh, for uh, some time just as it's schooling, uh, will have online and on campus learning. 
this will become a norm, not an exception. So not only will work hours diminish, but commuting time will diminish even more because much of the work will be done in the service economy, online, uh, and uh, from home or from a coffee shop or from a uh, uh, some local uh, place uh, near the home. It leads, I think, to two kinds of future scenarios that are prevalent in our public discussion today, and they're both possible. As technological advance continues, as artificial intelligence and deep learning continue to enable machines and computers and robots to replace human work in various activities, one possible outcome is a dystopian future, a worst world we could imagine, in which workers in general face falling wages and employment because uh, labor demand declines. Those who own the machines and the smart systems and the tech platforms enjoy rising profits and wealth while much of society experiences falling wages and employment. The result is a massive increase of inequality and a collapse of intergenerational mobility. Why do I say that? Because in a rich family that owns a lot of stock and equity in Amazon or Apple and so forth, the parents will give wealth to the children and the children will be able to get their education, uh, get their skills and have their wealth. Uh, whereas in a poor family, uh, the poor will not have wealth to bequeath and the young uh, members of uh, the next generation won't have jobs uh, from which to earn. And so they'll have neither the wealth nor the income potential. And this will lead increasingly to a two-tiered uh, society, the haves and the have-nots, where the haves own capital or the income from uh, the smart systems and machines, and the have-nots own labor but can't find decent employment. That is a perfectly possible, rather dreadful future. The alternative is a utopian future. In a utopian future, since technological change enables us more and more to carry out the work of society through smart machines, we have rising output per person in the society and therefore rising income potentially for all people in this society, whether it's through their own earnings or through social consumption, meaning the provision of goods and services by government, universal healthcare, universal education, universal uh, infrastructure. The utopian future features rising leisure time because we can do more and have more with less work of our own. And in terms of our daily lives and activities, it would enable us to give an increasing emphasis to caregiving, uh, to providing services that machines can't provide, uh, to uh, engaging more in continuing education, and to other creative and artistic endeavors as well. Uh, which of these is the actual outcome? that's less determined by technology and by economics than it is by politics. Because the dystopian future is a kind of libertarian future where government does not intervene to ensure a sharing of the fruits of advancing technology. Whereas the utopian future necessarily depends on an active collective project to ensure that the benefits of the technology are not owned by a small group of people, but rather are shared widely in the society. Oops, I was going to uh, um, show you some numbers, but I forgot to clip them uh, of uh, what has happened as we have moved online. Uh, 
we have experienced a shocking increase of wealth inequality just in the last two years. Uh, and in fact, uh, let me see if I can find on the screen, hold on, let me just uh, clip something and then uh, put it up for you because it's, I find it pretty mind boggling. Hold on. One moment. Okay. Now, let me see if I can get back to the screen in the right place. Oh, here it is. Okay. Nope. Uh, can you see, actually, can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so this is a website that I'm a little bit addicted to, which uh, I, uh, everyone can enjoy. It's, a blue, it's called the Bloomberg Billionaires website. It gives you the daily take of uh, how our billionaires are doing in the world. Um, and the point I wanted to emphasize for you is that Mr. Bezos uh, at Amazon, as of this morning, uh, as of uh, March 29, so yesterday, uh, had net worth of $181 billion individually. Elon Musk uh, of uh, Tesla and SpaceX fame, $160 billion of personal wealth. Bill Gates, $140 billion of personal wealth. Oops, they led in a Frenchman, Bernard Arnault uh, of uh, luxury uh, goods. Uh, he's at $123 billion. And Zuckerberg, uh, Warren Buffett, Larry Page, Sergey Brin of uh, Google, and so forth. So the, the tendency has been towards an astounding rise of individual wealth. And it is the, more the dystopian path right now. Bezos and Amazon are fighting desperately against workers uh, in uh, the Alabama uh, uh, Amazon site who are trying to unionize uh, and uh, have a, a somewhat higher uh, fraction uh, of uh, Amazon's uh, income flow. And for Mr. Bezos and for uh, Amazon, this is unacceptable. So there's a pitched battle literally in these days, uh, uh, or pitched political uh, battle, organizing battle uh, over uh, unionization of Amazon plants. Poor workers on one side, the world's richest individual on the other side. And in this sense, uh, we, we don't know what the outcome, we can't uh, call it right now, uh, what the outcome of this uh, battle between uh, the utopian and, and the dystopian uh, scenarios are. I find them both completely realistic. Uh, and uh, we just don't know uh, how this is going to turn out. Let me conclude with uh, my favorite essay in economics. Uh, by John Maynard Keynes, who wrote this scintillating essay in 1930 in the depths of the Depression called The Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. Because Keynes, uh, basically, he stole all my lines. Uh, he got there uh, uh, 90 years before today's talk, uh, where Keynes said, the march of technology uh, is uh, continuing. That is enabling us to have uh, more output per person. That is enabling us in principle to imagine the end of poverty, which he anticipated to take place uh, in the time of his grandchildren. Uh, so he thought that by uh, say uh, 50 years onward, the 1980s, the UK would uh, be uh, over uh, the, uh, would, would have seen an end of extreme poverty. And that prediction turned out to be correct. And Britain 
between Keynes's time and the 1980s <coughs> had developed the National Health Service and other institutions of the welfare state. And so many of the benefits of the rising economy that Keynes anticipated were in fact achieved. So Keynes said that uh, we should prepare for that utopian possibility. Uh, we should prepare for the day in which the need for work will really diminish tremendously. And then the challenge will be to make use of our time in a beneficial way for our eudaimonia, for our well being, uh, in ways that were not possible in the past. Uh, and I'll just read uh, these uh, closing paragraphs of Keynes. He said, I look forward, therefore, in days not so very remote to the greatest change which has ever occurred in the material environment of life for human beings in the aggregate. But of course, it will happen, it will all happen gradually, not as a catastrophe. Indeed, it has already begun, meaning this uh, automation and uh, the decline of uh, the need for physical work. The course of affairs will simply be that there will be ever larger and larger classes and groups of people from whom problems of economic necessity have been practically removed. The critical difference will be realized when this condition has become so general that the nature of one's duty to one's neighbor is changed, for it will remain reasonable to be economically purposive for others after it has ceased to be reasonable for oneself. What he's saying is, after this desperate quest for more and more income is over for ourselves, we should still remain charitable and attentive to the needs of our neighbors in society. The pace at which we can reach our destination of economic bliss will be governed by four things, said Keynes. Our power to control population, what turned out to be the so-called demographic transition, of declining fertility rates, our determination to avoid wars and civil dissensions. We had uh, not so good fortune there because this essay was followed nine years later by the outbreak of World War II, which Keynes had tried to help head off by his magnificent 1919 volume called The Economic Consequences of the Peace, where he warned about the possibility of another European war, our willingness to entrust to science the direction of those matters which are properly the concern of science, and the rate of accumulation as fixed by the margin between our production and our consumption, in other words, how much we save, of which the last will easily look after itself given the first three. In other words, if we're smart, if we're peaceful, if we have a demographic transition, then we will save enough for the future, and that will provide the end of poverty. So Cain says, we have to start thinking what a world of more leisure will be like. Meanwhile, there will be no harm in making mild preparations for our destiny, in encouraging and experimenting in the arts of life, as well as the activities of purpose. When we don't have to toil, we still have to have meaningful life. And then he ends famously, but chiefly, do not let us overestimate the importance of the economic problem. In other words, don't focus all your thinking on economics, because we have even more important things to think about, or sacrifice its supposed necessities to its supposed necessities, other matters of greater and more permanent significance, like what should we do with our lives? How should we treat our neighbors? Keynes ends by saying it should be a matter for specialists like dentistry. That's what economics should be. If economists could manage to get themselves thought of as humble, competent people on a level with dentists, that would be splendid. And indeed, I think that is a splendid idea. Uh, if we could be competent enough to find our way to share the benefits of rising technology so that instead of toil, we can have meaningful work, more leisure time, more time for creativity, more time for voluntary activities, more time for education. 
and a sharing of these benefits for everybody, that indeed would be splendid. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to end it. See, take care, everybody.